Welcome back. All right. Uh, I want to talk about something that occurred at the same time as what I talked about in a video earlier today, which is the, the Messier signing in Vancouver. Uh, so I want to talk about the Chris Gratton signing in Philly and how we get there. Because it's fascinating. Chris Gratton was a player who came into the league with a lot of expectation. He's the number three overall draft pick in 93. A pretty good draft. Uh, but... Gratton, it takes him a while to get there. 96-97, he had a very good season. Raised a lot of eyebrows. It's only his fourth year in the NHL, and it was believed he was on his way up. And he was a power forward, and he's a center. So those are coveted things in the NHL then, as they are now. Now, he would end up playing for seven different teams. In fact, he had three different stints with the Tampa Bay Lightning. So he wore the Bolts jersey a lot. Uh, and, and he did play for 15 years. But after year four where he had 82 games, 30 goals, 32 assists, 62 points, and 201 penalty minutes, as a restricted free agent, he attracted a lot of attention. So rumors start getting out there that there might be an offer sheet coming in that he's going to sign. That Gratton is getting close to signing an offer sheet. And so Phil Esposito, not wanting to, to lose the player and, and not get back what he wants to get back, he starts working the phones, working on, you know, figuring out where the best place is to make a deal. And he gets on the phone with Chicago and Chicago and Tampa, who are no strangers to trades with one another over over the years. Uh, they work out a deal. And so they talk to the league. Gary Bettman looks over the looks over the deal and says, well, no, because you're basically selling Grattan for five and a half million dollars is how he sees it, that. It's it's a cash deal on the Tampa Bay side, and it's not really a hockey trade, so they say no. So that sends, and this is in the early evening, Tampa and Chicago back to the drawing board to work out a trade that the NHL will approve. And so this is why, to this day, we have the trade call. You have the trade call, and after the trade deadline, you will see the trades come out, because the NHL has to approve the trade, Right? If the NHL doesn't approve the trade, you have to go back to the drawing board. So 9.45 p.m., August 12th. Uh, so this is the same day that Esposito's like, hey, I should probably start looking at moving Grattan. If anything, Esposito should have been looking to move Chris Grattan sooner, right? Uh, so both the Blackhawks and Tampa call the league office to say, hey, we've, we've got a new trade. Nobody answers the phone. They can't get anybody on the phone. Now... I know this is 97. I know it's before cell, everybody has a cell phone. I am shocked that nobody has call forwarding set up for the NHL in a situation like this. If two GMs have a deal worked out and they call the league office, somebody should answer the phone. There should be call forwarding. Clearly there isn't. So they leave a message. Because you got to do something. So they leave a message. And uh, both Bob Murray and Phil Esposito feel like, okay, so it's a done deal. 18 minutes later, Chris Gratton, who would have been unaware of a trade, um, and apparently they tried calling Gratton's agent as well and didn't get an answer. So um, an offer sheet is signed with the Philadelphia Flyers by Chris Gratton. Gratton's like, I want to play in Philly. That sounds great. Bobby Clark makes an offer. I'll take it. It's a five-year deal for $16.5 million, but there's a signing bonus for $9 million. So that's that poison pill. We talk about this when it comes to offer sheets. You want to make an offer that's going to put the other GM off. You give him that huge signing bonus money because Phil Esposito is going to look at that and go, I, I don't want to pay that for Grattan. Now, at this level, at the time, the offer sheet means Tampa Bay will get the next four first-round draft picks from the Philadelphia Flyers. It is a high price to pay. But as far as Bobby Clark's concerned, he's getting a guy who's a 30-goal scorer and who can get you 200 penalty minutes. He's a center. He's going to win you some face-offs. He feels like this is this is worth losing four first-round draft picks for. So it is interesting in that in his first year in Philadelphia, Chris Gratton, 22 goals. He ends up with 62 points altogether, plays the full season, ends up with 159 penalty minutes. So he played well. Were his numbers as good? As the previous season, the points are the same, the goals are less, the penalty minutes are less. A little bit different game for him in Philadelphia, right? So, this is all taking place. And, again, you've got two teams think they've got a trade. You've got a third team coming and going, we make an offer sheet. So, August 13th, Tampa Bay goes, hey, 
we don't like the offer sheet. We think it's illegible. So therefore, it's invalid. And I, I will say that even in reading this now and, and being reminded of this, I, I get a chuckle out of that. Well, I can't read it. Well, Granton could. He read, He signed it. So he was able to read it. So I think that's the important guy here, isn't it? It's not whether or not the Bolts can read it and agree to it. It's that Grattan did. Uh, and then August 15th, there was a 90-day uh, hearing on the 14th and on the 15th. A third-party arbitrator rules that the fax, which is the, the offer sheet, is valid. So he's like, yeah, no, this is, this is a valid offer sheet. If Tampa can't read it, okay, but it's a valid offer sheet. And, and that's interesting, too, because, of course, if the arbitrator had said, no, nah, this isn't valid, then Tampa Bay and Chicago complete the deal and the offer sheet is is ruled out. Or would somebody else somebody else have jumped in and made an offer sheet after the Hawks made that trade, right? Uh, and, and I guess the idea is that then the Hawks would have worked out a contract with Chris Gratton. So August 16th, the league says, we're going to have a hearing on this. We're going to have a little discussion. And August 18th, Gary Bettman... Um, basically answers the criticism that we had a trade. You have to respect our trade. That was done 18 minutes before the offer sheet was signed. Respect the trade. He answered with all terms of trade and of the trade and contracts must be reviewed before a trade is consummated. So before that trade goes through, the NHL has to review the conditions, which would be like future picks and, and money that might be involved as well as the players involved in the contracts that are there before they okay it. And he said, merely leaving a message is, is not good enough. That's not, that doesn't work, right? That you can't just leave a message and go, well, the trade's done because it's not. So until the NHL's reviewed it, it doesn't count. Again, I am shocked there's no call forwarding in this situation. It have to be. Like it's 9.45 PM. It's not like everybody's gone to bed. Right? You would think this is probably 9.45 p.m. Eastern Time, which would be 6.45 p.m. for us out here. Why don't you just forward it to somebody on the West Coast or something? But it, it's strange. It's a really bizarre thing. August 20th, so with the seven days after an offer sheet, where Tampa can decide whether they will accept or decline. They decline. They say, no, uh, we'll take the four first-round draft picks. The Flyers don't want to lose four first-round draft picks. That's a high price. So... They trade Michael Renberg and Carl Dykhaus to Tampa to recover those four first-round draft picks. So who were those four first-round draft picks? I'm glad you asked. 1998, it was Simone Gagne. So that's a bit of an ouch, right? Didn't Gagne end up playing for Tampa at some point? Um, and then 1999, is Maxime Ouellette, who was a goaltender. Uh, 2000, is Justin Williams, who had a half-decent NHL career, played there for a while. And 2001 is Jeff Wojtka, who was a extra fourth line kind of, you know, fifth, sixth defenseman. I believe Wojtka was a defenseman, fifth, sixth defenseman. So in, in making that deal to get those four first round picks back, Philadelphia avoids losing, I'll say, Gagne and Williams are the big names on there, right? So that's where for people who say, well, should you keep the draft picks? Or, you know, is it worth it? Is it worth it for a team to lose those draft picks? I think you can make the argument that four first-round draft picks is 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 a lot to give up. None of these are top 10 picks. None of these are, I don't even think any of them were top 20. Ouellette might have been top 20. I don't think so. I think they were all in the 20s. So Philadelphia giving up late draft picks, and you are adding Grattan to a team by taking away from the Legion of Doom line. Renberg off the Legion of Doom, right? I believe he was off the Legion of Doom before the actual trade. So you've got LeClaire, you've got Lindros, and now you're adding Grattan, who would be a second-line center with 30 goals and 200 penalty minutes. And that's what had Bobby Clark salivating, the idea of having Lindros and Grattan as your one-two down the middle. And it's just, it, it, it would have been very tantalizing for a GM at the time. The interesting part of all of this is, that's the only 30-goal season that Chris Grattan ever had, and December 12th of 1998. So, two years or a year after all of this, he is traded back to Tampa Bay with Mike Sillinger, because Mike Sillinger was involved in all trades at this time, um, in exchange for Damon Lanko and Michael Renberg. So, Mikhail Renberg ends up going back to Philadelphia a year and a half later. 
And it was it was interesting because, of course, Grattan going back to Tampa. Tampa would then trade him out. I think he went to Buffalo after that. And then Grattan ends up back in Tampa again after that. It's an interesting time if you're if you're a hockey fan. And again, this is before we have a salary cap. This is before we have all those concerns. There were some amazing things that took place. So there you go. The time that uh, Chris Grattan signed an offer sheet with the Philadelphia Flyers because nobody answered the phone when the Blackhawks and Tampa Bay uh, made that call. The interesting thing is general manager Bob Murray was unhappy. He felt like the league had hosed the Blackhawks in this. And he was like, yeah, well, we won't forget this. And I'll throw this in here too. Tampa Bay the year after finished 17, 55, and 10. Miserable season for them. Chicago was 30, 39, and 13. Not a great season for them. Philadelphia 42, 29, and 11. This is when they were contenders for the Stanley Cup. Just didn't quite get there and, and end up winning that championship. But it's fascinating, isn't it? All right, so there you go. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below, as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.